CFHA's board of directors for six years. She has served on advisory boards for HRSA, AHRQ, Integration Academy, the AIM Center, and APA Task Force, and others. And beyond all these field advancing accomplishments, Perinda is one of the kindest, most generous, accessible clinician, leader, scholars I've ever met. She gives herself to this field, and as a field, we have been thereby enriched. I'm proud of her accomplishments and proud to nominate her for this award. And I love this last statement here that uh, Frank says, because Frank did work with Don Block. I believe Don Block would agree with me. Sincerely, Frank agrees. So without further ado, Let's uh, cheer Perinda as she gives us some words of encouragement today. Perinda, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's overwhelming. Oh my gosh! I uh, when Andy Valeris emailed me, I just could just could OMG like and had to sit down with my weak knees. <laughs> and so um, I I will say uh, I never met Don Block. Uh, I did hear his voice and uh, that was during the Philadelphia, it was at Philadelphia um, CFHA and I think uh, Barry Jacobs and Susan McDaniel, Larry Mao, several people had organized a phone call and I think Susan, Susan just had her cell phone and um, you know she put it up and he, they, people were reminiscing with him and and talking with him and the rest of us were at this breakfast kind of sitting in awe. And I think what was uh, really striking for me was just the clarity of mission and focus and, and commitment um, from everyone. People were talking about uh, meeting in living rooms, you know, years and years ago. And I'm struck by now how many people come to the conference, what the organization has become, the evolution and maturity um, of the organization, yet the core values remain the same. And um, the sheer, sorry, I'm, I'm at our uh, Fifth Avenue clinic, which is a homeless health clinic, and I'm in the middle of consults and I've got PPE face and everything. So people are knocking on my door. I, I really need to go see patients after this, but uh, which is the fun part of what I get to do. So, um, and so I, I will say that that has struck me. The other piece is just the love that people have for him and the love people have for each other. And that has remained at CFHA. When, uh, when, when I look at, you know, even your faces and see people I love and adore and admire and uh, want to be when I grow up, uh, and I hear um, people talk in conferences, I see the listservs, there is such tremendous um, respect and uh, focus on the right things. And that doesn't happen a lot, unfortunately, certainly not this year. Um, where there's a lot of talk about that is involves ego and, and uh, positioning, but we, we focus on the right things. We focus on the values and advocacy and, um, and supporting uh, this mission of improving the quality of life and the well being of our community. And there is true love and caring and respect. We all root for each other. That does not happen everywhere, guys, I can tell you. So this is a very special organization, and this is certainly a very special honor. The uh, last thing that Don Block said on the phone, and it will stay with me always, everyone was saying, bye, you know, signing off, bye, 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 and he said, give him hell. And everyone was like, oh yeah, of course, that's what he's saying. We're going to give him hell. But I think that that was a call to action and it recognized that we are really all gladiators and war warriors um, in this fight. That when it comes to equ health equity, social justice, access to care for everyone, we are very good and, and kind to each other, and but we remain unrelenting. That mindset that was there many years ago is just as important now. 
is just as important now. And I see it in all of our work. So um, I'm supposed to say thank you to the people I want to thank. I want to thank everyone who was at that breakfast, everyone who brought me into the fold at CFHA, um, everyone who has um, fought the good fight will continue to fight the good fight. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. And um, I can't say it with that rough gravelly voice that he said, but I will say, give them hell guys. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Perinda. We're so proud of you. We're so happy to have you as a colleague and as someone that we look up to. So we will take those words to heart. All right. Um, Perinda will, will probably go back to putting on her PPE in good uh, 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 good 2020 style. Um, our next award uh, is the Family Oriented Care Award. And so part of uh, CFHA's origin story is around this idea that a biopsychosocial approach under, should undergird the entire way that the health system is organized and that care is delivered. And so it naturally became obvious that a patient and their key relationships, inclusive of however they define family, should be at the center of all that transformation. And so it is part of our origin story as well that family-oriented care is a key component of how care ought to be delivered, how we ought to transform the healthcare delivery system. So this award recognizes an individual as nominated by the Families and Health Special Interest Group. Um, this award uh, 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 highlights an individual who's done work either in training, in promoting research, and in clinical work related to uh, uh, fostering this family-oriented care work. So this year's awardee of the Family-Oriented Care Award is none other than Max Zubatsky. This is a name that you ought to be very familiar with. He's been so active at CFHA at, um, in so many levels uh, from the very, very early start of his career. So we're really excited to have Max um, receive this award today. Let me read you a snippet of the nominating sort of letter that Max received. Um, Max had, con this is what the uh, author of Tyler Lawrence said, Max had contributed, has contributed substantially to family-oriented care. In his role as a program director for the St. Louis University Medical Family Therapy Program, he educates the next generation of family-oriented practitioners. He's held multiple leadership positions within CFHA's Families and Health interest group, emphasizing the organization's mission of including the family as a key component of quality care. Lastly, his family systems lens has clearly shaped his contributions to the literature. A few examples include, quote, personal illness and family of origin, end quote. These are titles of articles, medical family therapy and endocrinology, and a health systems, I love this one, a health systems genogram for improving hospital transitions to primary care. Max, we're really proud of you. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks so much, Neftali. Um, it, Tyler, by the way, was one of our doctoral students. So I, I'm not able to give him extra credit for class anymore. But um, so um, thank you again to uh, Neftali, uh, to you, to the CFHA board, um, to the special interest group, um, certainly that have been a part of, uh, which has been wonderful the last three years to Ruth and everyone. And we have uh, great leadership in the SIG going forward, uh, as well as a lot of mentors. I see a lot of familiar faces here uh, on the screen and have worked with so many of you um, through collaborations, clinically, research, uh, training. It just uh, was overwhelming when I saw uh, my name in the email for the award. So thank you very much. Uh, as Naftali, as you said, um, I direct the program at SLU and I think one of the biggest benefits is being able to uh, train family medicine residents uh, and kind of hybrid um, over in my roles and to see the impact we have on students uh, and residents simultaneously. Um, I, I think what this award really um, means to me is I've really seen the context of family so much different since I started my career uh, compared to before. And I always kind of envisioned, um, you know, the nuclear family is something that you work on in practice, but 
Uh, I've really expanded the definition and certainly during the pandemic that a family is not only what you work with and practice, it's your community, uh, it's your workplace, it's all of you, it's colleagues. I think as we extend the definition of family, we see the importance that it has in our resilience um, and our intentional work that we do. Um, and just echoing again um, from what uh, Prinda and Naftali and others have said about Don Block, um, he said, you know, we're we're building the ship as we sail here to have really uh, family centered and family oriented uh, mission here uh, in the future. And uh, I think for many of you that were at Amelia Island and the Wing Spread Conference many, many years ago and were pioneers and had those amazing uh, conversations, I'm sure. I wish they were audio taped um, as far as the future where family oriented care was going. Um, I think we have a great generation going forward you're um, really instilling that. And again, during the pandemic and afterwards, it's gonna be um, really much more meaningful in, in terms of uh, how we focus on family and our work. Um, I'll end in uh, a newsletter we're gonna be putting out uh, from the SIG uh, was a pay it forward edition. I know I've reached out to many of you um, who kind of give words of wisdom to the next generation. And um, I think that's really inspired me as a uh, as a trainer uh, and as a learner, uh, what we can kind of uh, pay it forward in our work. Um, I, I really got into this, uh, you know, meeting Bill Doherty at the AMFT conference in 2006. And I found uh, looking through a box, uh, as we all do our fall cleaning during COVID, um, there was a little sheet on a conference letterhead. And um, when I uh, spoke to Bill, um, he wrote down some book recommendations, of course, put medical family therapy first up there and to make sure you buy that one. Um, but then at the bottom, he said, um, look up CFHA. Um, if you, you get into the medical family therapy program, get locked in. That's going to be one of your core and key organizations to look at. Um, crumple a piece of paper and a stack of everything. And um, almost 15 years later, is just a reminder as far as, again, um, you know, your mentors and, and really paying it forward and what matters. So Again, I, I thank all of you for uh, you know all the collaborations, and I, I think we have some great work going forward. So, thanks so much. Thanks, Max. Um, we look forward to seeing what the rest of your creativity has for uh, the field and um, our work together. Thank you. Um, our next award. Um, here is the Outstanding Contributions to the PCBH Model Award. Now, again, connecting back to our origin story, so um, one application of the biopsychosocial model, which really is much more comprehensive than uh, we often give it credit for, but one application of it is this idea of integrating behavioral health and uh, medicine. And uh, one particular model that emerged right alongside really the timing of what Max talked about, the Wing Spread Conference, which was this organizing event where uh, some of the founders got together and started conceiving of CFHA. Um, concurrent with all of that was the development of this way of integrating behavioral health professionals into primary care that came to be known as a PCBH model. And so, this year's uh, recipient of the Outstanding Contributions to the PCBH Model Award is Casey Clardy. Now, uh, I'm going to read a snippet of Casey's uh, nomination letter from uh, Rosa Espinosa. Um, this is what Rosa said. An admirable quality of Dr. Clardy was her ability to use her position of power as a behavioral health director at the Lawndale Christian Health Center as a platform to increase access to care and narrow healthcare disparities within low income and underserved settings. Her values and vision to promote the PCBH model closely align with CFHA's value of promoting comprehensive and cost-effective models of healthcare to, to, to deliver integrated care. As the director, Dr. Clardy gracefully represented and successfully advocated for the behavioral health department and fostered the integrated care model within the clinic. Now, as a side note here, um, and you should all know, of course, that staff have nothing to do with these awards, their nominations, or anything else. Um, these are purely, the PCBH model award in particular is sponsored by the PCBH SIG and voted on by PCBH members. But as a side note, um, 
even though I've never met Casey, Casey and I have a particular connection. And that is that about 20 years ago, I was the first director of integrated care at the Lawndale Christian Health Center. So it's, uh, it's really cool to see again, the tie, the historical tie to all the work that we all do. Um, as Max said, when we pay it forward, that work multiplies itself going down. So Casey, I'm really pleased to present you with the outstanding contributions to the PCBH Model Award and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Naftali. This means a lot, I think, as we think about paying it forward and um, especially just the honor of being nominated by a student of mine that she's now a postdoc, but she has been one of those that has seen me at my best and my worst in my work life, right? She knows what happens behind the door with my patients. Uh, she sees me as a gringa, struggling along leading a Spanish speaking uh, treatment group and uh, has, has been along for the journey over many years getting to, to work really closely in, in collaboration with her. And uh, as Natalie mentioned, I think that idea of the cyclical nature of what we do and how we are constantly mentoring the next generation even though Natalie and I have never technically worked together, right? We have been mentored by the legacy he has left us at Lawndale Christian Health Center and really some of those formative first partnerships and the way that our organization started to think about holistic care and what could a psychologist or a mental health provider do for a physician, for a community? How could that look? And so we continue to stand on the shoulders of giants. And so then to have now my student nominate me we are still watching some of Naftali's videos in our clinic, some of our old iPsych videos that we will pull up for patients. Uh, if you haven't caught, uh, if you haven't gotten to see those, make sure you check out those gems. Uh, we still have some of our patients watching them. Actually, Rose and I, my students. So this was very, very fitting and apropos that we're getting to do this today. So thank you. Um, I think some things that stand out to me as we think about this work and as we're moving forward into the next um, decade, thinking about how could we contribute if we do not have something to integrate into? And the value of integrated care is really to strengthen our relationships, whether that's with the patients that we are seeing, whether that's with the community that we're serving, whether that's with the physicians, medical providers, nurses, care managers, fill in the blank uh, in your healthcare context, because we cannot be operate in a silo. The very nature of integrated care is to integrate into something else. And so it's very difficult to do that as one um, and you have to do that as many. And so I think I'm most grateful to my team. There is no way we would have been able to do um, so many of these things and have a, a lot of these accomplishments occur without some of even the leaders that are on the call here today. Um, if you all haven't gotten a chance to meet Catherine McLean or Emily De La O or Dennis Bourne, uh, some of our leaders, uh, behavioral health leaders at, at Lawndale, please make sure you get a chance to connect with them. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize those key partnerships that we have had not only within our organization, but also outside of the organization. And I think that's important to think about as for those of us that are integrated into community health settings, really addressing health disparities how can we use the power, the privilege, and the resources that we have to help our patients and our communities navigate the continuum of care? That so often there's so many barriers to quality care or to access or to culturally congruent or trauma-informed services. Um, and so really thinking about the way to make longer standing contribution and legacy is through those relationships, those partnerships, and really expanding the services that, that are provided. So thank you so much. This is a huge honor uh, to be recognized among the CFHA community. I feel like we always look to CFHA to, to not feel so alone, <laughs> to not feel like, oh, there are other people across the country doing exactly this type of work and how relevant uh, the community is. And so we're grateful to be able to contribute to that and to be a part of it. So thank you so much for this award. Thank you, Casey. All right, our final award today is the Founders Early Career Award. So once again, in line with what you've heard about Don Block, he was an energizing individual, someone who drew others to the work, um, sort of had a magnetism about that from every description uh, possible. Now, part of that was also engaging uh, young people and especially engaging early career professionals. In fact, many of the gray beards and white haired individuals that you see on the screen here today were much younger when they 
uh, uh, were with Don Block and were drawn by him into this work. And so the Founders Early Career Professional Award is really a way to recognize those folks who are just starting out, but already showing that energy and enthusiasm for the work of transforming the healthcare system, again, undergirded by this biopsychosocial approach. So this year's Early Career Award recipient is Miss Olivia Boguki. And Olivia uh, will have to uh, uh, forgive me if I've completely butchered, particularly her last name here. Uh, she's not able to be here with us, but she did drop us a video that we're gonna play here in a moment. But let me read before we switch to the video, a little bit of, her, of the letter describing some of the early work. Um, and this is just a snippet. When I read the entire letter, I was like completely intimidated by her um, uh, already, even though she's within the first five years of her career. <laughs> so Dr. Baluki has been playing an essential role in problem solving the associated clinical and administrative challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. When stay-at-home orders were, were issued across our entire medical community, uh, she continued to come into the primary care practice and work side by side with our primary care leadership team in rapidly redesigning the practice to bridge care to our patients. She led the creation of patient education materials and interactive e-learning to serve the growing mental health concerns of our patients and providers during the pandemic. And specifically, she teamed with our patient education de department to leverage a technological solution to disseminating high yield evidence-based skills and resilience building and cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Because a lot of us have had insomnia during 2020, right? So thanks, Dr. Boguki. These are a few words from her that she uh, left us in a video. Hello, my name is Olivia Boguki. I'm currently a second year clinical health psychology fellow at Mayo Clinic. I want to sincerely thank CFHA for the Founders Early Career Professional Award. It is an honor to be recognized for my work in collaborative care and integrated care. I wish I could be there to thank you in person, but as you know, the needs of the patient come first. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Craig Sawchuk, for his mentorship and support over the past year. If you've ever met Craig, you know that he's always smiling and always very well caffeinated, which makes him an absolute delight to work with. I'd also like to thank my team here in Integrated Behavioral Health and Primary Care. While I don't have time to thank every one of you personally, I am so appreciative of your support day in and day out. I do want to say a special thank you to Drs. Mark Williams, William Leisure, and David Katzelnick for allowing me to hit the ground running research-wise and providing me with countless collaborative opportunities here in Integrated Behavioral Health. Our work in integrated care is so important. As we enter another wave of COVID-19, the mental health impact is becoming more and more evident. It is a privilege to get to help people cope during this difficult time. Now more than ever, the importance of integrated care is clear. Please continue to care not only for your patients, but for yourselves. Wishing you all health and safety. Now that's an awesome way to bookend. I mean, we start off with Perinda Khatri, uh, uh, just with her inspiring work over decades now. Um, we look back to the, the instigation of the organization of Don Block, and then you hear a young, energetic voice uh, carrying it forward at the very outset of her career, um, carrying the mission forward. I mean, how, how I, I I'm in incredibly grateful for uh, each of the awardees and for what they exemplify related to our community. Now, uh, one of the other ways that we do have members recognize each other is with something we call the wing spread. Now, usually we don't name these necessarily individual individually at an awards event because they're basically one person sort of uh, 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 honoring someone else in their life who's uh, made an impact in their life. But today, since we've had, we just have a smattering of these folks, we're going to name them today. And then uh, since many of them are here, I'm going to use them to guide us into our next discussion uh, related to policy here going forward. So this year's Wingsford honorees, remember these are peer honorees. 
So others nominated them include uh, Mr. Travis Koss and Ms. Jenna Fisher and Dan Mullen, Jeff Ryder, and none other than Patty Robinson. And uh, Liana, you can stop share here now actually for a moment because I, I wanna actually ask you guys, those uh, there, that are here, Travis, Jeff, Patty, Dan, um, uh, Jenna, if you're here, I don't know that I see you, but um, I just wanna ask you guys what it means to be just, um, uh, before we jump into our policy, what does it mean to, to uh, be a part of CFHA and to have colleagues um, uh, who are there to cheer you on? What does it mean to you to have that? Can you share just a few words? So I, I can uh, share. I think one of the things that's so amazing about CFHA um, and being a part of this group is there are a lot of organizations um, that talk about how and why and what, but I think CFHA has um, pushed so hard to move theory into practice and has made it so that integrated care isn't the future anymore, it's now. Um, and I think what's amazing about being a part of this kind of system together and, and something like the wing spread um, being nominated by, by a peer um, is you're not a lone wolf, right? And so many of us work in so many different areas, whether it's primary care or behavioral health or um, research or whatever, that to have this group together um, to be a part of that, I think is just, uh, I'm so appreciative and humbled and um, it's an amazing group of people. Awesome. And I think I could say that, you know, I think that we all know how important it is for us to have, you know, in our personal lives to have a, a home, to have family, but that is equally important, I think, you know, in our professional lives and and, and for me, that's what CFHA really, you know, uh, does is it provides that professional home and that professional family that, you know, gives you that sense of community and, and, and belonging. I mean, it, there's a lot of other kind of, you know, pragmatic, practical uh, functions that it serves too to be in, in CFHA. You know, you can, it's a good way to find consolidated information and help from other people and so forth. But, but just giving that sense of, you know, professional community, <clears throat> family and home, I think is, um, is huge. And it's been incredibly, you know, important for me. I think to play off the family perspective here, there's a lot of shared values, uh, shared goals. And yet in all the years I've been involved with CFHA, I just feel like the focus has broadened as the field has grown. Instead of what is, you know, MFT, what is PCBH and how you do it? Now it's like, how do you nuance it? And every bit of it is encouraging of how can we grow and do something different with this or involve this in a different way? And that's one of the fascinating things I've seen at conferences, conversations and publications is nothing seems out of limit as long as it exists within this integrated setting. And I just love that about this organization. Uh, uh, so go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Patty. All right. I would just say, you know, um, uh, echoing what uh, Jeff said about it's a home. I was always the kind of um, BHC that loved to do things like make muffins or, you know, take food to work. Uh, and so I don't know. I, I miss that because I don't have a clinic at this point. And it's like everything CFA feels like. Uh, a connection to me. So I love the connections that I have with people, um, mentoring connections, people I go to for advice or input. I love that it is a source of research and uh, that it is a place where people can innovate and speak about their, their innovations. So I'm just very thankful for all the work everybody does to keep this growing and thriving and it's awesome. Yeah, uh, Dan Mullen, I, I'll just echo 
um, everything everyone else has has said. I agree with all that. I, I think, um, you know, I didn't really prepare to answer this question, but I, what comes to mind is the idea that uh, you have to, uh, when you're in CFHA, you, you get so much constant feedback and uh, you get a sense of all the really impressive innovation that everyone else is doing around the country. And that inspires you to keep moving. Like in order to just be standing still in the community, you have to keep progressing and advancing and innovating. Um, I, so it's not the word competition, um, but it um, you get a sense of everyone around you moving forward and advancing and that that keeps you going and keeps you from resting on your your laurels i guess or just being satisfied with what you accomplished last year um and i think that's that's great that that's inspiration um that's motivation thank you thank you all i couldn't agree with you guys more yeah it's it's sometimes freaking intimidating what you see happening um in the breath of it um uh, and, and, and it's, it's challenging in such a good way uh, to, to, to sense the energy and the creativity that continues to come to the fore. So, um, and what's also really cool, I think, uh, I would say about CFHA and what we're, what we're expressing gratitude for today is how um, kind of flat the organization is top to bottom, right? I mean, if you look around at the squares, I'm in gallery view here. And you can see on one corner, you got Larry Mouch on one corner. And you know, you've got Dan on the other, and Jeff and Patty, um, Max somewhere in the middle there. You know, these are these are people who uh, we live and work with um, and who are some of whom have years behind them, others who are uh, newer uh, at the work. And so, but going up and down the organization is super easy. <laughs> Like you can reach out to these people and they will lovingly take time out to uh, be with you, to spend time with you. Um, so uh, yes, I hope that this, this moment has um, helped you, helped inspire you, helped inspire some gratitude for the work that has been done and hopefully inspires you to continue that work in your area of the world. Now, I'm gonna, we're gonna use you all as a, as a community to start thinking about the future. Um, you know, CFHA has been very much a practitioner-driven organization historically. We've worked from the bottom up. We don't have a big policy think tank. We don't have lobbyists in Washington. Um, but we do have a voice that's emerging, that's stronger, clearer. We have a community that's grown. If you look on our integrated care map, you can see that in practice, we have sites in virtually every state of the country that are practicing some version of integrated care, broadly defined. Um, and so we're really beginning to think about how we can create a more active role in having a voice, especially in the policy level. So I wanna ask you all, and I'm gonna actually challenge specifically our wing spread honorees and our other awardees today to be the first to respond today. I wanna ask you all about um, uh, policy and what you think of are the key barriers to getting your work done. Could be in your state or your region. Now remember that policy refers to things as broad as uh, the undergirdings of how payment happens or how licenses are regulated, or it can refer to how systems are organized. So they're not, policy doesn't necessarily relate to the specific laws or regulations, but they're the ideas that undergird the uh, way that laws and regulations are, are implemented, either at the governmental level or at the institutional level. So when you think about your work, what are the things that consistently get in the way of living out this biopsychosocial vision that CFHA is built on? What gets in your way. So I'm gonna to toss this to someone who's never uh, short of thoughts on this and who I deeply respect as a result. So um, Dan, are you still here with us? 
Uh, yes, I am, but I, I just stepped into the kitchen to grab lunch, so I totally missed what you said. Um, I'm That's sorry. Fine. It's a 2020. I, I, I didn't get an overcooked chicken dinner delivered to me during the speech, so I had to go find something. Uh. So Dan, Dan, and, and Dan's a board member. He's been involved in lots of policy. So Dan, I, I just the basic question I asked, um, which we've also discussed at board meetings, is related to policy. What are the things that get oh. in the way in your corner of the world? Yeah. What What's that friction point or friction points that get in your way related to policy? Um. Well, I think it's what everybody talks about most often is trying to get off the fee for service. Uh, hamster wheel. Um, uh, You're still there. Okay, sorry. Um, the the fee for service hamster wheel, I think, is the biggest issue. Um, I think there's a lot of promise with the state Medicaid programs that are uh, that are bringing down the the wall between the mental health payment stream and the medical payment stream. I think that's the greatest one of the greatest opportunities. Um, sometimes that comes while you're getting off the fee for service hamster wheel. Other times it seems to be coming sort of independent of that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that, I, I mean, those are the ones where, <laughs> that I think will make the biggest difference uh, for the most amount of people. Um, so let me, let me yeah. have a follow-up question that I'll ask you that I'll also ask others to comment on. So when it comes to changing policy as it relates to payment reform, yeah. how do you feel as far as your capacity to make change or to be a change agent? So on the continuum of, yeah. I feel impotent, yeah. no voice, to uh, I really feel like I have a clear pathway for how we can affect change in the world. Where yeah. do you find yourself? Um, somewhere in the middle. I mean, if that was a, a, a one to 10 scale, I'd, I'd do like a three to four um, uh, towards the impotent side, I guess. Uh, you know, when I get invited to meet with people in state Medicaid programs or um, in Massachusetts, we have something called the Health Policy Commission, which advises the state on policy related to controlling healthcare expenditures. You know, I show up and I speak. Uh, I think I I don't know that I'm always the right face for it. I mean, it. Um, so I went to school with Ben Miller, uh, graduate school, and he was always a master at that. He knows how to shake hands and smile and uh, focus on the uh, finding points of agreement quickly with the people he's trying to uh, lobby. Uh, whereas I'm more likely to be cantankerous and not be invited back. Um, perhaps the, that's the Roger Kessler mentoring that I've received. Uh, those are the two, those are the two extremes. Uh, so I don't know that I'm always, uh, uh, I think it's getting easier for me. Uh, I, you know, I, I like to think of myself as being an expert in motivational interviewing. And it's not clear to me why, as soon as I get in front of a bureaucrat or a politician, I forget all of those skills. And I think that that uh, coming in hard uh, and lecturing or uh, acting like the expert is the way to go. So, so I think towards the impotent side, I could use more skills in practice for engaging uh, bureaucrats and politicians in these discussions. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. I think you've voiced a lot of the, the feelings we've had. Um, if I could throw it to Jenna. Jenna, so Jenna, you're at a big behavioral health uh, entity. And I'm wondering in your corner of the world, same question. Where, where are the friction points related to health policy in your world? Um, so I agree 100% with Dan. Um, in moving away from the fee-for-service model toward value-based. Um, I remember having a conversation, I don't know, Natalie, a couple of years ago maybe, where uh, we're talking about you know, Pennsylvania and the carve-out state, and it's, it's stuck with me. And Natalie, you said it's not about the carve-out, it's about the regulations. And it's about what makes it hard to deliver the care, um, some of that being payment models. I, 
on a scale of one to 10, I don't know. I'll, I'll go with Dan's three to four. I, I think what's been huge for us in Philadelphia has been um, developing active partnerships with the payers. And that's gone so far with the behavioral health payers, but then also with the physical health payers, we've created active partnerships where they have rewritten fee schedules for us and we get things paid for that never existed before. Um, so Merrick, he is a behavioral health, I, I work in the behavioral health division of that. And um, it always frustrates me because we call it reverse integration. I'm like, ah, it's still integration. Um, just because we're bringing physical health into, uh, into our world. Um, but that does bring with it a unique set of regulatory and payment challenges that I think we've been able to really move forward hard um, because of those partnerships and those relationships that have been built up. And, and it's sort of a good point that uh, when we think of policy, we often think of like going to Congress, right? And talking to the senators, but a lot of health policy, at least where it starts hitting the, where the rubber meets the road uh, proverbially is actually at the payer level. And I would actually, I, I echo Jenna, a lot of the progress has been made at that peer level with individual relationships. Um, and you know, to that end, Natalie, if I could kind of throw it over to you here, um, you've been at this for a long time um, and oftentimes at the policy level, trying to move different entities that relate to how um, health policy is conceived and then how that gets translated into action. When you think about um, uh, historically what those friction points are with regard to health policy that supports integrated care, um, what, what comes to your mind? And the second part of the question is, what do we need as a community to get better at this area? Natalie, that was for you. Sorry, I missed my name in all of that. <laughs> so, um, you know, the um, um, I think that what's worked for us is what Jenna said, is the kind of relationship based on the ground, um, long-term persistent, of accommodations and, um, you know, kind of massaging the system. Uh, but that is very, that's, that's worked for us, but it's still very um, uh, place-based and uh, organizationally based and not broad-based policy. Um, so it seems to me that we need to uh, not only use those relationships to amplify our own voices because some of the partnerships we have developed have greater or lesser access to state level decision makers and so forth. But we really need to um, do a lot more uh, on the kind of research and metrics side uh, to kind of marry the relationship goodwill with the storytelling, with the hard evidence, uh, particularly return on investment evidence. Um, yeah, and we're, we're not there yet. You know, we're sort, we sort of rely on the anecdotal um, far too often, which works at that local individual relationship level, but not necessarily to rewrite policy. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Max, I, I want to throw it to you here. I'm going to put the spotlight on you here for a moment because one of the areas that that um, I've seen some really interesting growth in in the last year or so is in um, reconceiving healthcare from a family-oriented perspective. Um, there's some really cool stuff out of New York State around sort of uh, beginning to include family members in or advocating for family member. Part, uh, participation in Medicaid plans, for example, so that you're treating entities versus individuals. Um, and just from a larger level, 
just just the idea of even thinking of the system of care in a biopsychosocial fashion, let alone a family oriented fashion is we're, we're pretty far from there right now, right? So when you think about uh, policy from the perspective of how it becomes inclusive of a patient and their context, what, what gets in your way or what gets in your students way of beginning to practice in a way that aligns with your values? Uh, how much time do you have? No. Um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, and I, I just, I guess, to build off of that of, of what Natalie said, too, um, you know, one of the things in the family field I, I think we, we need is more uh, evidence-based research and really solid outcomes showing, um, you know, good improvements in families around health care. And I think that's going to really impact uh, policy changes. I know for us with MFT, I mean, we're having a, a huge issue just with reimbursement, um, not only with family uh, care, but just in general. And I know a lot of the mental health disciplines are really struggling with that as well. Um, so I think when you're constrained, um, as far as not only your employer or healthcare system you're working with, but how you can practice, I think that constrains your work you can have with family and how much time you even have in the room uh, to work with a family and to kind of build that into your plan and, you know, then to really uh, convince other stakeholders and leaders uh, of this impact from clinical and research side too. So, um, yeah, I heard, you know, some of the things they're trying to do in New York and um, I, I, I think, again, the, the, the coverage issue, I think, is going to be an ongoing issue with, with family-based care. I don't think it's going to be a, uh, an overnight turn on, unfortunately, but um, I, I just think we also need more push interventions instead of pull interventions in integrated care around families, too. If they can't get into clinics, how can we put more uh, mental health services out to families and really expand outside of the clinic and, you know, the ivory tower settings and really, uh, you know, expand our, our coverage and, and bandwidth um, because the access to care we're seeing with families is a huge problem. So it's a great question. I don't have a full answer, but it's a lot of, you know, moving target. Yeah, I think that what you just talked about is is um, points us in the direction of the work we need to do, right? And and I love the idea of where policy could push us to thinking differently about the units of outputs that we look at, right? So we typically think in medicine of thinking of units of output related to a particular disease. We don't even think about the person. We think about the disease and the outcomes related to the disease process, right? That's how far we are from where we want to be, where we're not even just thinking about the person, but we're thinking about the family unit. Um, we're thinking about the community around that family as the unit of output that we want to measure. Um, and that does create a very different paradigm for both research, practice, and policy. Right? How are you going to say you're doing what you're supposed to say if you're even in your policy, you're not really thinking of those outputs as what you're going to measure, right? For what quality care looks like, right? So I, I know we're short on time here, but um, I, I want you to know that this is a conversation that we're just starting to have um, on, the, on the board level. We're starting to have this. And in fact, Liana, if you could pull up that uh, draft policy slide, I'm going to give you a sneak peek at something the board has been working on related to a very, very basic starting point here, right? So, and this is a draft. The board has not approved this. This is out of a subcommittee of the board uh, around policy principles, just a way to undergird how we will think about approaching policy, right? And so there's three policy principles that we've begun to center around. One is uh, that CFHA would promote healthcare policies that promote the inclusion of integrated behavioral and medical care in health policy initiatives. So an example of that is like if so if you have PCMH as a health policy initiative, then we would support um, integrated care as a key component of what PCMH is and does. And remember here that we're thinking of integrated care here broadly as encompassing all the things we've just talked about today. And a second principle would be that we promote policies that expand the integrated care workforce. So to Max's point, for example, um, then CFHA would be supporting as we have historically, 
um, LMFTs, LPCs, other uh, professional groups as simply being licensed behavioral health professionals that can be reimbursed for the work that they do, just like other licensed uh, professionals, right? And then lastly, um, that CFHA would promote healthcare policies that promote fiscal and administrative integration of behavioral and medical services. And so this is to Dan's point that a key barrier to making any changes in how we operate on the ground is that these systems are conceived in their silos and thus they are paid in their silos. And so you see uh, efforts to integrate behavioral health management uh, entities with physical health management entities. So CFHA would be in favor of policy that drives those things forward. So we're starting, here's a starting point. And one of the things we'd like to do is organize the community around these. So we're gonna ask you all for feedback on these. So you'll see this once the board approves the final version, we'll ask our membership to see what they believe and feel about these things. And then sometime in the spring, we wanna get everybody together for a spring policy focused event. Um, and and uh, that event would be uh, sort of a twofold thing. One is to educate us so that like on Dan's spectrum of impotent and uh, totally clear pathway forward, empowered, that we move individuals in the community from there maybe three or four position to a five or seven position. And so for that to happen, we need some basic education on what policy is, how you, how you engage policy at every level. I, I think of it as how to be an influencer, right? How to learn how to be an influencer in any sphere that you exist in. So that's one of the things that we want to have happen out of this. And then secondarily, because so much of policy is local, our hope is that folks are able to then join in to regional and state-based groups and meet at least a couple of times in 2021 in those regional state-based groups so that they can work together to solve practical problems in their spheres and build relationships in those spheres that can influence the development of policies in their areas. Understanding that we, it's really hard to do that on the national level, but on the state and regional level, we've got some opportunities. So that's a sneak peek. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been reading the comments on the, on the chat. Thank you so much there as well. Natalie, thank you for that last comment as well. We're so grateful to be part of this community. I'm grateful to go into, uh, thank you, Casey. Wow, we're gonna save this chat here. <laughs> um, uh, so Liana, make sure that the chat is saved. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sending us into our Thanksgiving with a spirit of gratitude and some energy that uh, leads us into hopefully a brighter 2021. Stay safe, everyone. Um, be well, take care of yourselves, take care of your teams. And we look forward to seeing you at our next community meeting. Bye, everybody.